Welcome. We're glad you're here with us again. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and jump right into tonight's uh, message. It's about anger. We're going to be talking about anger and we're going to look and see what scripture has to say about how we can better control our emotions. So I got a question. Have you ever been so angry or so mad that you just can't even think straight? You, you get into that position and you, and you maybe make a decision or you say something um, or you do something that later you regret. I know that personally I have, uh, and maybe there's somebody out there saying that doesn't sound like you, and that's awesome and good for you, but for the majority of us, the rest of us, I think we can all relate uh, to that. Anger, for most of us, turns into something that uh, makes us fall, it makes us stumble, um, we, we, it, it interferes, it hurts our relationships with other people. Um, when we get angry, our, our emotions tend to take control of us, and that's when we do the things that we regret. And it, it happens to everybody from time to time. It, it is normal. Uh, but my question is, it, just because it's normal, does that make it okay? Just because fits of anger seem to happen to everyone, it seems to be human nature, does that make it okay for us as Christians to fall victim to that? Currently, personally, I'm in grad school uh, pursuing a degree in mental health counseling. And uh, I, I can tell you, I've, I've, studied, I've studied anger management quite a bit. I'm going to have to study it a lot more. But I can go ahead and give you a little bit of insider information. Uh, and that's that I can offer you a lot of techniques and advice uh, on how to manage your anger. But they're really just all band-aids. They don't bring true healing, just like a Band-Aid doesn't bring healing. It, it, they don't bring healing. They don't bring uh, renewal or transformation. And they definitely don't repair the damage that's already been done. Uh, I can help you mitigate the damage next time, but I can't actually address the root of the problem. Um, but fortunately for us, I do know a guy. I know a guy who addressed that problem, and he addressed it 2,000 years ago. His name was Paul, uh, and he addressed it in his letter to the Ephesians. Um, and he talked about it in terms of a conflict. It's a conflict between our old human sin nature and our new nature uh, as a Christian. And our new nature is a follower of Christ. Listen to what he's got to say. He says, With the Lord's authority I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Paul begins by making a distinction between his audience and the Gentiles. His audience would have been those that are following Christ or claiming to follow Christ. So that's us. But the Gentiles that he's referring to would have been those who were living in the world, who were consumed by the culture, um, and were not trying to follow uh, Christ. He says that we should no longer live like they do. He takes it further. He says they are far from God. That's pretty strong terms. We can already see uh, just from the first couple of verses in this passage that, that we're called to live differently. So we need to go ahead and start asking ourselves now, do, do I look different? Because if I'm called to live differently, I, I should look different. But Paul continues to drive that point home in the next few verses. He says, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. First, He reminds us that we have a model for our lives in Christ. If we're going to call ourselves disciples of Christ, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, which that's what a Christian is, it's claiming that I am a follower of Christ, I am his disciple. If we're going to call ourselves his disciples, we need to know what it truly means to be a disciple. A disciple is someone who does what the teacher does. A disciple goes where the teacher goes. 
He, he is doing his best to imitate the teacher. That's what a disciple of someone does. And if we're calling ourselves disciples of Christ, we have to be doing our best to imitate Christ in all that we do. Jimmy just finished up a series about the truth and the fact that it only comes from Christ. Because of this truth, Paul urges us to throw off our old way of life. We are not called to look the same as everyone else. Just because something is quote-unquote normal doesn't mean that it's okay for us as Christ followers. We're called to let the Spirit, what Paul say? He said, let the Spirit renew our thoughts and attitudes. He talks a little bit more about this in greater detail in, in his letter to the Romans. In chapter 12, he says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. That is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If we want to truly worship our Creator, Paul says we have to give our bodies completely to Him. But look, there's a promise attached to that. There's a promise that says if we do this, He will transform us into new people. How's He going to do it? He's going to transform us by changing the way we think. He's going to change the way we think. Listen, I've already mentioned that as a counselor, I, I can't transform you. I can only slap band-aids on you. But Christ says, I can. I can transform you, and I'm going to do it by changing the way that you think. But you have to give yourself to me completely. What does that look like? What does that look like practically? What Paul continues in Ephesians, he says, So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Now I want to make something clear. Does Paul say that, the, that feeling the emotion of anger is a sin? No, he does not say that. What he says is it will become sin when we allow it to control us. It becomes sin when it begins to affect our actions. He goes even further to say that when we allow ourselves to be controlled by anger, we're giving a foothold to the devil. Peter actually talks more about this in his first letter. Uh, in chapter 5, he tells us that Satan prowls around like a lion, lion waiting, waiting for someone to devour. Think about that for a second. Think about how a lion hunts, Okay. When a lion is hunting, there's a herd of gazelle or zebra or something, and they're moving together as a pack, right, as that herd. The lion skirts around the outside waiting for one to be injured or one that's younger that can't keep up with the rest. And when he finds one that's vulnerable, that's when the lion attacks. And Peter says that's exactly what Satan's doing. And Paul tells us that when we allow ourselves to be controlled by anger, we're making ourselves vulnerable to attack. He's give, we're giving him a foothold. We're giving him ground to stand on. Don't give Satan ground to stand on by allowing yourself to be controlled by your emotions, to be controlled by anger. But Paul continues. He continues with his practical application. Listen, he says, If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul language or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness Rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Paul shows us that true worship of God, true worship of God, when we give Him our lives, it results in change. It results in us being a changed person. It results in a changed lifestyle. 
I don't want you to look at this passage from Ephesians as a list of do's and, and don'ts. And look at it as a list of results. If we're truly in step, if we're truly walking in step with the Holy Spirit, and you can be a Christian and know Christ and be out of step with the Holy Spirit, go to Galatians if you want to read more about that. I don't have time to get into it. It's a little past my purview. But uh, if we're walking in step with the Holy Spirit, these things that we've talked about are natural byproducts of it. These are the results of a Spirit-led lifestyle. But listen, I don't want you walking away thinking, well, I get angry. I get angry quite a bit and, and it controls me and I do things that I regret. So I must be a really bad Christian. That's not what Paul's saying here. What he is saying is he's reminding us that we don't have to concede the victory. We don't have to go ahead and give up conceding the victory to our emotions. We can choose to put on this new nature. We throw off our old sin nature, but look, it's a choice. It's a daily choice. It's a moment-to-moment choice. This is a situation-to-situation choice. We have to be cognizant and realize, look, I have to choose Christ. I have to choose to do what He would do. I have to choose to follow Him in this moment. And if I do that, if I continually do that, He will begin to change the way I think and transform me into a totally new person, one that doesn't respond that way, one that is tender-hearted, one that is kind, one that responds with love instead of anger. But it's a process. It's a process. And, we, and, and as we're growing in this, we have to look to Christ as our example. He's the blueprint. You hear in Scripture a lot Him described as the cornerstone. And I'm sure many of you know, I'm sure many of you know what a cornerstone is. But for those of you who don't, um, in those days when you're building a building and you're laying the foundation at the very beginning of the project, you cut a cornerstone. The cornerstone would go in the corner and it had to be perfect. Its measurements had to be absolutely perfect. Its angles could not be off by a degree because every other stone that was laid, every other stone that was laid on that foundation was measured off that cornerstone. So if the cornerstone is supposed to be at a 90 degree angle and it's at 91, by the end of the wall, we've got an angle that's way off. And if it's at 89 and it's supposed to be at 90, by the end of building those exterior walls, the angle is way, way off. So the cornerstone has to be perfect. And fortunately, we do have a perfect cornerstone to measure ourselves off of. That is in Christ. We're not perfect yet. We're still under construction, hence the construction zone. But we are working towards it. And if we are allowing ourselves to be led by the Spirit and we're allowing His Word to pour into us, we can get there. We can control our emotions. We can free ourselves from the bondage of of this this tie to our, our, our worldly emotions. That anger that used to control us will subside. We'll start to think differently. We'll be transformed. So my prayer for you tonight as you get into the discussion um, is that you allow yourselves to be opened up and start to allow yourselves to be transformed by His Word and by uh, the Christians that are in the room with you. Allow Him to speak to you through the Holy Spirit working in them. So let's be open and honest with each other because if we, if we keep it all bottled up and, we're not, and we don't allow ourselves to share boldly and honestly, then we're wasting our time. So I, I challenge you to open up, share boldly, honestly. Maybe we've got couples in the room that want to share how anger has affected them in their lives or maybe, uh, maybe some relationships that have been hurt. Um, that we want to that we want to share and get that off of our chest, and we can we can work together towards being better and being more and more like Christ.